three, two, one. Good morning and welcome to the first Case Live of 2022. We're coming to you here live from Racine, Wisconsin, the home of Case Construction Equipment. I have with me uh, one of the true gentlemen of Case Construction Equipment, Mr. George McIntyre, product manager for Skid Steers and CTL. And uh, I've also got Mr. Shop Talk, Ted Polzer, joining us again on the Case Live stage. I don't think anyone has ever called you a gentleman. <laughs> but we'll, we'll maybe get there today. Thank you all for joining us. We know you've got a lot of things pulling at your time and attention, and we're, we're very happy that you're here with us today. As usual with Case Live, you'll notice there's a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen here. This is not a situation where you have to hold questions to the end. We encourage you to uh, uh, place your questions in the Q&A box there throughout the morning. And uh, as we're going through uh, the presentation and get to that Q&A section later today, uh, we'll throw questions out to the guys and uh, encourage that live discussion. Why is this the first topic that we decided to kick off 2022 with? Well, last year we talked a lot about the versatility of equipment. We talked a lot about uh, how you can take an asset that you already have and, get, and earn more money with it, improve that total cost of ownership by actually improving the profitability of it. Skid steers and CTLs are already two of the most versatile pieces of equipment that you can own. Adding attachments to it makes it all that much more versatile, and that's what these two gentlemen are here to talk with us about today. So with that, uh, we'll jump right in. George, I think it's, it's important that we um, uh, start off with some of the basics, and uh, why don't we share with the folks at home what are the different levels of auxiliary hydraulics that we can get on skid steers and CTLs? Sure. Thanks, Bill. We offer three core systems, standard, high flow, and enhanced high flow. The most common system is the standard flow auxiliary hydraulics package that we offer. Although flow rates differ by manufacturer and model, the flow rate of the standard flow system ranges from 17 to 24 gallons per minute. Standard flow auxiliary hydraulics are included in all machines from the factory and operate on the same pressure that the machine's main hydraulics operate on which is approximately 3,000 to 3,500 PSI. A standard flow system powers many of the most common hydraulic attachments on the market, such as four-in-one buckets, hydraulic hammers, aukers, trenchers, and grapples. All right, and if you're looking to go beyond that standard functionality, what's that next step? Yeah, the next step, uh, that's where you'd have the high flow auxiliary hydraulic system that further increases the machine's versatility and productivity, productivity as with Standard flow, it operates on the same pressures as the main hydraulic circuits. The flow rate, however, ranges from approximately 30 to 42 gallons per minute. A high flow system can be factory installed as an option or installed later in the field, although it's obviously preferable to have it done from the factory. It powers the production type attachments that require a high flow rate to perform as, as specified. Examples include cold planers, many snow blowers, rock saws, small mulchers and chippers shredders. And it's important to note that on all new, on our all new TV620B, we made these high flow hydraulic standard as to give the owners the true power and performance of that machine. So George, this year with the launch of the TV620B, we have talked a lot about those high power, high capacity attachments like cold planers, like mulching heads. And while those can work with a high flow system, we've talked about the importance of enhanced high flow. Break that down for the folks at home and why that's important. Sure, I can do that, Bill. Enhanced high flow auxiliary hydraulics have flow rates that are similar to a skid steer with a high flow package, yet it operates at 4,100 PSI. So it's at that higher pressure rating. Examples of attachments that use an enhanced high flow system would include large coal planer, large mulchers, and, and, uh, and rock saws where you might be able to uh, clear brush, and, and you know, small trees with that mulcher much more efficiently than you could 
with a regular high flow system. So George, and, and so that's a great breakdown of the three types of uh, systems available on the machine. One thing we don't talk about as often uh, are questions about the, uh, the secondary circuit that's available mm -hmm. on these machines. What kind of applications and attachments is that secondary circuit going to be used for? So that secondary circuit is uh, used for an, uh, when you have an additional function where the primary circuit's not able to do that. So you'd want to put the secondary auxiliary hydraulics on there. And those applications include things like a side shift function on a coal plane or a stump grinder, uh, on a snow blower, when you want to change the direction on a chute, you may need to have the secondary auxiliary hydraulics, or with a tree spade where you need to have the, the down riggers. That, that's another area, uh, example of when you may actually need to have that as well. Thank you, George. Excellent uh, description of that. Ted, uh, so George talked a lot about, as we're looking at um, the systems available, he talked about uh, PSI, he talked about gallons per minute. I think that, that people uh, often don't understand uh, the difference between the two, or they think in some ways they're the same, but really that's important for people to understand the type of system they need to run the attachments they want to, uh, they want to run. Explain for people at home the difference between PSI and flow and how that kind of relates into yeah. matching an attachment up to a machine. This is a really, really good point because when we, we start to talk about this, let's start just from the fundamentals. Flow is going to be the speed of an attachment, if you will, under no restriction, right? So when you read something about a, an attachment that says, you know, that its maximum gallon per minute is 30, that's meaning, you know, at a max, and that's probably at no pressure or resistance to that flow. But as soon as we start to resist flow, that's when we start to build pressure. So it's really important to understand what your maximum constraints are for your attachment on the flow and that pressure. And it's also important to know that the two of them cross at some point to basically create the most productive point where you want to use that attachment. Cold planers, as an example, if you go out and you're crowding it too hard and now you're running at, you know, let's say it's a maximum of 3,000 PSI just for this discussion, the problem that you're going to run into is you're going to start to generate heat and you're not helping the productivity of the machine. You could be more productive by actually backing off a little bit and reducing some of that resistance to the flow because your attachment will run probably more consistent with its speed in addition to you're not fighting that additional heat that's being built in the system. So it's extremely important to understand exactly what your machine will do and exactly what your attachments are capable of accepting. So as we look at a, an attachment like a mulching head, yeah. I think some people would say, well, uh, with a high flow, I get the same gallons per minute as I do with an enhanced high flow. So why is the, the added pressure that enhanced, fly, uh, enhanced high flow gives you, why is that added pressure important for attachments like right. a mulching head? Yeah, it's extremely important because pressure gives you a, an idea of how much work you can do. And we, we'll probably talk a little bit more about these calculations coming up, but yeah, it, it's extremely important because now if I'm able to run at a 4,000 PSI limit, I can you know, hold that higher pressure, meaning there's more resistance to like the drum turning you know, on a mulcher. But what's more important about that then too is that we can understand exactly you know, how much higher we can go to maintain that productivity. Um, it, it, it is really important at times if these are new attachments to somebody that hasn't ran one, one of the training aids that we've used in the past is we've simply put a pressure gauge in an area that's visible to the operator and we mark that and say, hey, you're more productive at this pressure and lower and by doing that, a lot of the um, you know, questions and some concerns that we've had from customers go away immediately. So it's a really easy, quick tip that, that works really well. And there's a good number of attachments that come with a pressure gauge on right, it as yes. well so that the, yeah. the operator Yeah, can the attachment it. industry is kind of catching up to our tips and tricks that we've actually used for quite a few years, which is great because it's a big value. As they should, as yep. they should. Another thing that gets thrown out is hydraulic horsepower. And we could get into the equation about multiplying the flow uh, by the pressure divided by 1,714. Uh, we don't need to get into that. I think that's going to just complicate things. Why is hydraulic horsepower important? And what does that mean in terms of that uh, overall effectiveness and productivity yeah. of an attachment? Hydraulic horsepower is important to know because it's essentially telling you hydraulically what your machine's capable of doing, right? What kind of productivity it's going to be capable of. Now, 
What's important about this is that many attachments are also rated by their hydraulic horsepower. And so with that being said, what we typically do is we use this as a way to also gauge and judge the match between the attachment to the machine. Doesn't make a lot of sense to take an attachment that you know, can only accept 40 hydraulic horsepower on a 90 hydraulic horsepower machine or vice versa. So it's always important to have those matched um, you know, when you're looking at new attachments. Um, if you don't know, I know Bill just mentioned that equation and I'm not even gonna try to regurgitate that, but that being said- I had to look it up. I yeah, don't, yeah, if you're not familiar with it, it's a very simple, quick search out there on the internet and it's important that you know if you haven't seen it published on your machine, you can quickly, cal you can quickly calculate what you've got. And that way, moving forward, you know exactly what attachments are the right attachments for your machine. And George, I think uh, uh, it, it's important to, I'm gonna come back to you in just yeah. a second to talk a little bit about properly matching uh, attachments. But uh, as it relates to the TV620B, 114 horsepower, mm -hmm. you have that with an enhanced high flow system that gives you that uh, 42 gallons per minute at about 4,100 PSI. Uh, we've, we get a lot of questions about, is that big enough? Is that powerful enough to run a Fecon mulching head in Texas? What have we done with the TV620B in terms of testing it and making sure that that machine can run those high capacity attachments mm -hmm. no matter what the conditions are? Yeah. Yes, so Bill, as far as what we've done with the testing on the TV620B, we've actually put more hours on the TV620B than we've ever put on a machine previously. And a lot of those hours were out there in the field with a mulching head attachment on there. That, we know that's one of the primary applications that we're gonna see the TV620B running in. And we know it's a high demanding application, a little bit more of an extreme condition than some other, other type of applications. So we certainly had a lot of focus uh, on that particular application and putting hours on the unit. Yeah, we were able to, I, I think, prove out that the cooling capacity has been improved and that that machine is gonna operate those attachments without any problems in those right. environments. Yeah, that's absolutely right, Bill. So regarding the cooling package, if you look at the entire machine structure, it's a plant, brand new uh, ground up design for us. Uh, we were willing to go to a larger size and with that larger size, meant uh, we could have the cooling package in there that fits the needs of the applications that we're gonna be doing. And one of the primary ones, as I already mentioned, is uh, the mulching application, but also cold planing is also one of those applications that require the additional cooling capacity uh, required. So regarding uh, additional cores, we do not say that you need to have a roof mounted core uh, in those applications. Uh, not saying that there may be some instances when maybe that needs to happen, but we've actually designed the machine so the cooling package that's on there We'll do the proper pulling, uh, cooling for those standard attachments. So we've talked now a, a lot about the types of systems available, flow, hydraulic horsepower, pressure. Uh, what advice or what things would you give uh, to the folks watching today about properly matching attachments to the machine and what they need to consider uh, as they're selecting attachments? Yeah, that's, this is a great point and boy, I got a lot of tips. So a couple things to consider about this is, you know, we talked about hydraulic horsepower and understanding what your machine is capable of. A really common misconception out there is that people think, okay, if my maximum hydraulic horsepower is, you know, 40 as an example, if I buy one that's capable, an attachment that's capable of 60, well, that's great. I can grow into it. I'll have it longer. It'll work on more machines. Well, it, it will function, however, you have to remember that when we build an attachment um, for high pressure, you know, such as this enhanced high flow, we're typically looking at a different type of drive motor inside of that attachment. You know, maybe it's an axial piston motor versus a gyrotor motor on a low flow, low pressure type of attachment. So these are really, really important points that you need to understand because by while buying that attachment that may be able to couple up to a couple of other machines, it's not gonna be as productive. So it's always important to really dial down there and make sure exactly what the productivity is. And speaking of productivity, another tip that I like to throw out there as well, which isn't necessarily a problem for owner operators, they pretty well know exactly what they have to have their settings to in the machine, but a lot of our newer machines have adjustable flow right from inside the cab. And with that being an option, there can be some confusion as to, well, what, what flow should I be running with this attachment? One customer that I visited had a great idea they made a laminated card that basically told all of their operators, if you're gonna run this attachment, set the flow to this. 
And so what it made was it made for more productivity out of their attachments. It also reduced some of their risk of having the wrong attachment. Maybe it's a low flow attachment coupled to a large high hydraulic horsepower machine with high pressure system and now you have a failure. So that's what we're trying to avoid and just simple tr tips and tricks that way. Um, we talked a little bit about the pressure gauge and watching that pressure gauge. Um, it, it Again, I wanna reiterate how important that is. It's a very inexpensive way to understand exactly where you can be and it will drive a lot of consistency with your operators as well if they are watching that target. One other thing that comes into that as well is some of the newer features that we've got in the skid steers that I, I wish I had when I learned how to run some of this stuff was like creep control. Creep control is especially important when you're taking, you know, a mulcher, a cold planer, any of these things where it's going to be, you know, a, you need a consistent long hydraulic horsepower pull out of that attachment. Creep is nice and controllable um, versus back in the day, right? You know, you, you sneeze and jerk the controls and you stall the attachment and then you restart. Yeah, that's right, Ted. Yep. And if you look at the creep control function that we have on these, these skid steers and CTLs for case, Another piece of that is the amount of increments that we allow. So we've set it up so there's uh, increments of one to 100. So you can actually set it in one increment. So you could be at 40, 60, 65, or whatever you need to get that very precise speed that you need for an attachment. Uh, what we found in testing is that does make a big difference in being able to set that exact speed uh, for the attachment. So George, one of the things that, that Ted touched on, and I, I wanted to, to have you dig into a little bit further. People can get frustrated with attachments, and, and this can sound like a sales pitch, uh, but it's not. Uh, we tell people if you're entrepreneurial minded and you want to grow your business, uh, you may think starting with standard is okay uh, for now, but two years from now, you may buy a mulcher and you're going to be frustrated with the performance of that on a, a standard system. Why is it important for people to have that long view of what their business is and where they want to take it when they're thinking about which auxiliary hydraulic system to put on that machine? Yeah, absolutely, Bill. I'm glad you brought this up because if you look at what's happened in the industry over the last 10 years is we're seeing a lot more of the customers are, are wanting to have machines that have the higher flow ratings. So we're seeing actually our take rates out of the factory are increasing quite a bit uh, going to the high flow and the enhanced high flow systems. And I think especially in today's world, as we know there's a shortage of supply, particularly in CTLs out there, why wouldn't you just spend that little bit of extra money now so that you're ready to go in the future with, with uh, attachments that would be more demanding and you don't have to have a kit installed on the machine after the fact. Yeah, and I think that the other point too I'd add to that as well is if you're a customer that doesn't own a, a lot of attachments and you're heavily renting attachments, having that a machine equipped with different you know, high flow auxiliaries and things like that from the factory gives you the capability to be able to get attachments easier rather than having to pick and choose through exactly which ones fit. It gives you that little bit of flexibility. Right. You know, maybe you can run a little higher pressure you know, attachment now and get the most out of it while you're running it. Yeah, that's a good point, Ted, because if you look at the, the system itself, we know that you're able to actually switch between the different modes. So even if you have enhanced high flow on there, doesn't mean that you need to run an enhanced high flow attachment with that. There's a switch within the cab, which allows you to switch between a regular high flow and the enhanced high flow. And then of course you still have standard high flow to run those attachments that would require that. And I think we, we've talked about if you have an undersized hydraulic system for the attachment you want to operate, mm -hmm. the converse is true as well, right? You could have enhanced high flow, but if your attachment that you own is, is maybe more well suited for standard, you're gonna be frustrated by the performance of that machine. You kind of give people an idea of what happens uh, in, in that setup and, and why it's important to make sure you're matching attachment to machine properly there. Yeah, there, there's two different ways there and I think Ted kind of touched on this earlier a little bit, but you can actually have attachments that you're actually running an attachment that is, is uh, actually set up to be with a much higher our flow rate it's not gonna perform very well uh, at the low flow rates and vice versa. If you're actually running an attachment that's set for low, low flow, so let's say it's a low flow attachment, you certainly don't wanna to put it into the high flow range because then you're gonna have issues with that attachment for sure. And another thing that we talked about uh, in, in preparation for this was 
the importance of, of as, as possible, using attachments that have been tested and have been proven to work with the manufacturer of the machine. Give an idea of why that's important uh, uh, as you're selecting attachments. Yeah, sure, Bill. So, yeah, it, it is important to make sure that you are working with an OEM approved attachment. So we, we had a case work with multiple different attachment suppliers, uh, but when we do see issues, Invariably, it's, it's because it's uh, a customer that's bought an attachment uh, that we were not even aware of. and maybe a small supplier out there that didn't necessarily understand the specs on the machines that on our end that is going on. And that's where you really start to run into problems uh, when you don't have an, an OEM approved attachment on that machine. And Ted touched on it a little bit, but I wanted to uh, have you dig in on it a little bit more. Hydraulics on demand, which we introduced with the TV620B. Describe that to the folks at home and, and what's the benefit uh, during daily operation on that? Yeah, absolutely, Bill. So we have hydraulics on demand, which is a, a great feature. It, it allows you from inside the cab on our eight inch display, you're actually able to go up there and change into different increments of percentage increments of how much flow rate's gonna go out to the attachment. So that allows you to dial into exactly what's needed for that particular attachment in that particular job at that particular time. So there's no need to, to move outside the machine, which is what would happen in the past. We had to actually go out outside the, outside the cab to be able to change those flow rates. So the great thing today is with an EH control machine from Case, you're able to do it right from inside the cab. Yeah, and one thing I'd throw out there too is if you, if you do purchase, maybe you have an old machine and you purchase a new attachment and that new attachment doesn't necessarily you know, work to the level that you would prefer and maybe it matches up on paper with the hydraulic horsepower that we talked about. The other thing that you always need to consider too is if you have a machine with a lot of hours on it, it could have, over time, we've seen that where main relief valves and things like that after they've been heated, you know, start to settle a little bit. And believe it or not, having a main relief valve in your main machine just being a couple of hundred PSI low can make a big, big difference. And so, you know, it's important that, you know, work with your dealer. They can do some really quick tests as well to understand exactly, you know, what the maximum pressure is and if your max main relief is in spec. Uh, it's extremely important. It can save you a lot of money just in the productivity alone. Ted, I'm going to have George uh, walk me through the uh, connect under pressure manifold here in a second. Any other tips or tricks uh, from your end that you would share with our viewers today? Yeah, a, a couple of other ones that, that I like to point out as well is when you do have attachments, I mean, the, 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 the plague, right, that you run into when you have a lot of attachments is there's attachments everywhere. There's hoses exposed, they're out in the elements. Make sure that when you guys are storing attachments that you're keeping the, the you know, hydraulic couplers for the end of those attachments it, from laying on the ground, get them out of the mud, keep them, try to keep them covered as much as possible. Some operators prefer to snap them together as well, which is another option. So those are some things that you wanna make sure, but if you do have these connections that are off, prior to coupling up to any machine, make sure that the connection points that are up on that manifold, the hose connections that are on the, the attachment side are extremely clean. Um, it's just gonna help preserve the, the you know, full capability of your machine. We have some stuff on that coming up here in just a yep. moment, so I'm glad you touched that. George, we talk a lot about the, the, uh, the connect under pressure manifold on these machines. Uh, give people just a, a brief explanation of, of how that works and why that's important uh, when you're trying to efficiently connect and disconnect attachments. Yeah, yeah, sure, if I can do that, Bill. Uh, the most important thing uh, as far as a tip would go, as far as uh, when you release an attachment from, the, from a skid steer or a CTL, would be to relieve the pressure right away. So there's two things that need to happen. The first thing is on the attachment itself. We highly recommend that you actually connect those hoses together so that you have the, the pressure equalization throughout that attachment. So that's one thing. But secondly, uh, we highly recommend that you actually relieve the pressure on the, the, the Skitzer CTL uh, right away as well. So you do that by pushing in uh, the, the two quick disconnects on the out, outside here. This is your case drain in the middle and allows the pressure to be relieved within the entire system. And that, that goes for whether you're running a, a standard flow hydraulic system, a, a, a high flow attachment, or an enhanced high flow, which would actually be on the other loader arm there. So simple step, you push them in for both, both sides there, and then that's where you're gonna have that relieved pressure. 
and that's going to help you on those 90 degree days when everything is stuck. It's going to help you uh, detach and attach right. much easier. Right, absolutely, Bill. And what's hap what happens is when customers or operators get into trouble with this is they're not taking those first steps. So that's when they're going to run into the issues. So when you, if you don't do those two steps, you know, having the pressure relieved in the attachment itself as well as in the machine, when you go out there later on, half an hour later, that's when you're going to see the issue. And at that point, it's going to be much more difficult to, to relieve that pressure. Thank you, George. And with that, we're going to uh, take you to the premiere of a brand new Tech Talk video that we have uh, where George will uh, describe for you the quick and easy detaching of attachments on case skid steers and CTLs. And when we come back, we will take your questions, start dropping them down in the Q&A box now, and uh, we'll throw your toughest questions at Ted and George here in just a second. Thanks, guys. One of the difficulties we hear about from customers is the ability to reattach an attachment, especially in hot weather after uh, it's been sitting there for a while. So the key to a good attachment or attaching into the quick disconnects is to detach it properly. First of all, the most important thing when you're planning to attach or detach an attachment is to make sure that you have the loader arms all the way down to the ground with the attachment on the ground as well. And then make sure that the engine is off as well. And then you can go ahead with the process of detaching or attaching those hoses up to the machine. What we re recommend is that you relieve the pressure in those lines by pushing the quick disconnects in. And it's about a quarter of an inch that you push those quick disconnects in. And that allows the system pressure to release so that the next time you're planning to run an attachment, you don't have the back pressure within the system. When you detach the attachment from the machine, we recommend that you hook the hoses together and that allows you the attachment to equalize its pressure as well. And if you follow that procedure, every time you take an attachment off your skidster or compact track loader, you'll be able to hook the attachment up easily and repeatedly going forward. Another important point to take into account is with the hoses and the quick disconnects to wipe those off. You don't want to bring any contamination into the system by having dirty quick disconnect lines. For more on this and the entire line of case equipment, visit your local dealer or visit us at kce.com. And we're back. Thank you again all for joining us this morning. We've already got some good questions coming in. Uh, fun uh, little point of order. This has been one of the uh, best attended and best registered for case lives that we've ever had. Uh, so thank you for taking the time out on a Wednesday morning. Uh, a couple notes, I wanna uh, welcome and thank the folks at Lehigh Career and Technical Institute. Uh, we love it when we have the tech schools join us and, and register for these events and uh, we appreciate you taking that time. And Brent Mueller, uh, Ted Polzer said he's been waiting for a long time for you to get back to him, and, and you text him back during the middle of Case Live. And uh, so, no, we appreciate you joining us uh, today. We've got a lot of good questions coming in. Uh, again, the Q&A box here is for you uh, to ask your questions to Ted and George. And uh, in a little bit here, we'll talk about the next episode of Case Live. And uh, uh, first, though, we'll jump into some questions. Um, one of the first questions that, that came in, we've talked about a number of different uh, topics here. Are there any concerns with sharing attachments from machine to machine? Yeah, I can take that one. So yeah, there, there are some unique considerations that you need to make. Um, if you have one attachment that's being shared across multiple machines, and you've experienced some sort of a hydraulic um, issue with one of those machines, it's important that you let your dealer know that if that machine was running that attachment, it probably needs to be involved in a cleanup process or at least an inspection as well. What you don't want to do is have some sort of a hydraulic you know, opportunity where there's debris in a system and then take that attachment, move it to a known good machine because now you're essentially giving it that same contamination. So it, it's always important to make sure that you keep some documents and understand exactly which machines have been run with with which attachments, if at all possible. 
Thank you, Ted. Um, do the uh, question on the 14 pin connectors there, do the electrical connections come standard on K skid steers and CTLs? Yes, so the, the 14 pin, pin connector you can see uh, behind me is standard equipment uh, on all of our skid steers and CTLs, except for our very small skid steer model, which is the SR160B. Uh, I know that uh, as far as 14 pin connectors goes, uh, there's another brand out there that has a seven pin connector. We do get questions about that uh, quite often. How can I connect that other attachment with a case machine? There are companies out there that sell adapters for that. So if you do have a situation where you have an attachment that has a, an end on it for a seven pin, you can go to a company, uh, Skid Steer Genius is one, that's, you can go online and, and check with them for an adapter for that. Thank you, George. Um, Mary Abbott, uh, Mary, thank you for joining us here this morning. Uh, has a question, uh, and I think this came in right about when we were uh, talking about uh, pressure gauges. Uh, isn't the pressure gauge on a mulcher installed on the top of the mulcher and already visible from the cap? I can certainly take that one since I kind of uh, opened up the, the discussion earlier. Um, you're right, newer attachments, a lot of new attachments come with a pressure gauge on them. Um, the reason for my comment earlier is because there are several of those same types of attachments that may have been prior to you know manufacturers equipping them as standard. It's something that you can certainly add to existing attachments just to create that visibility or awareness to your operator of, of what you're doing with that attachment. So it's something you can retrofit to anything if needed. Thank you, Ted. Uh, Chris Scott. Chris, thank you for uh, joining us here this morning. Uh, Chris would like to know, he says, as I have watched this, I've looked through several attachment brochures and none of them show horsepower. Why is that? Yeah, so it's something that the industry's kind of been going to uh, more recently. Uh, most of the OEMs are now publishing that hydraulic horsepower spec, but it's actually a very easy calculation. Uh, there are website calculators that are out there that you just plug in the max flow rate of your machine of the attachment as well as the uh, the pressure and then it'll give you that calculation so that would allow you to to figure out exactly how that attachment would made up with the machine itself thank you george um, if i have an old attachment and i don't know how uh I don't know its recommended flow rating, how can I know if it will work with my machine? I, I would certainly reach out to whoever the manufacturer of that attachment is or the dealer where you purchased it from. Um, you know, typically your dealers can also take a look at an attachment, understand the type of the motor. Um, there's some different types of specifications that are stamped on those components that they might be able to help you decode so that they, you can understand these are going to be your maximums. Um, if it's a, you know, current production type of an item, most of the, the dealers will be able to answer this just right through the phone if it's something that you purchased from them. Yeah, one other thing I would keep in mind when you're looking at that is whether that the fitting itself or the connection, the quick disconnect, will actually made up with the machine. So a lot of the, the newer models are coming out with larger diameter uh, hoses as well as quick disconnects. So you may need to order in a, a, a quick di disconnect fitting in order to be able to mate it up with the machine. Another question uh, has come in here. We talked a little bit about secondary hydraulics and cold planers. Uh, very direct question on that came in about, do I need secondary hydraulics to run a cold planer? Great question, I'll take that one. So kind of what we talked about on this is it depends on the vintage of the attachment itself. Older planers that were out there before we had a lot of electro hydraulic valves that were mounted on the attachments, you needed two different types of oil sources to be able to control the side shift separately from the drum. Okay, so as time went on, the newer attachments have integrated a, an electrohydraulic controlled valve that's out on the actual attachment, and it's basically now being controlled off of your joystick. And so the attachment itself, once you're commanding that, is directing that flow to where that it needs to go. So, you know, older planers, if you want to hang on to that planer and you don't have a secondary auxiliary, you can add that secondary auxiliary to make it work. Or if it's a, a newer machine, we, we've even run it to the opposite way where you have an older machine that doesn't have the electronic controls for the joystick, but the attachment requires it. And so that's where you need to work with your dealer. They might have some solutions to that to make sure that you can get your attachment to work properly. 
Thank you, Ted. And we've got a, a, a bunch of great questions coming in here, and uh, we're going to take a few more of them here in just a moment. If we don't get to your questions throughout the broadcast today, we will follow up with you uh, after the broadcast. But I'm dropping three links into the chat box here uh, right now, and, and, and those three links uh, are, are pretty cool. One of them, the first one, is announcing the next edition of Case Live, and uh, we will be bringing back some familiar Case Live faces uh, that you have seen over the last year, and we're going to be talking about the proper love and care of your undercarriage. Yes, we're finally bringing the uh, the topic of undercarriages to Case Live. We're going to be talking dozers, excavators, compact track loaders, anything with a tracked uh, 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 track system on it. Uh, we know that that is a major point of uh, upkeep and total cost of ownership. We will dedicate an entire case live to that topic on February 23rd at 10 a.m. Uh, the other two links, since we're talking so much about attachments and hydraulic fluid, uh, we dropped the links in uh, to the uh, parts store uh, where you can explore case attachments and OEM approved hydraulic fluid for your case skid steers and CTLs. Uh, back to the questions here now on this topic, uh, appropriate, uh, any considerations for hydraulic fluid in cold weather? It, it was minus 14 when we pulled in here this morning. Yeah, and I can take that one as well. So yes, I mean, what you wanna do is focus on your machine. If the climate that you're operating in suggests that you need to run specialty oil, such as a, maybe a colder weather synthetic type of a, an oil, um, your attachment, as soon as you hook that attachment up and you engage that, is going to flush the oil that's in it and it's going to mix in with the oil that you have. Uh, and, and that's not a huge concern. I mean, it is normal to, to have that type of a scenario with skid steers or any of these attachments. But um, that once you've done that, you've essentially basically, you know, you're using that same type of oil. Your attachment's going to see the same benefits that your machine does once you've done that. We just this past summer we just um, we just introduced the new precision grader blade, which turns the large frame yep. CTL into a motor grader. Question here uh, come in uh, from the field about uh, whether they need secondary hydraulics to run that case precision grader blade. Uh, actually, uh, secondary really hydraulics is not required for that particular attachment. Uh, one of the things that we you do need to have, of course, is the precision on it. So you'd have to work with uh, either the Leica, Top, Topcon, or Trimble system to be able to have that installed on that, that machine or on that attachment. Thank you, George. Um, a question in here from Shane. Uh, Shane would like to know, can you discuss the process for utilizing enhanced high flow on the machine? It used to be different than the regular high flow. Is that still the case? Maybe just talk through about the different ways that you engage high flow versus enhanced high flow uh, when you have those uh, options. Right. So when you have uh, enhanced high flow versus high flow, the switch configurations do change a little bit uh, based on uh, the attachment that you're running. And that has to do with the secondary auxiliary hydraulics that we talked about quite a bit here. So on an enhanced high flow unit, you actually do get the secondary auxiliary hydraulics. So on the skitzer behind me, uh, if it actually had enhanced, it's actually not available for this model, but it would, you'd see the lines running down the, the right-hand side of the loader arm, and you'd have additional hoses that you'd be hooking up. Thank you, George. <laughs> um, any tips for stopping the pinching of hydraulic lines? We, we hear about this quite a bit. Uh, uh, yeah. What do you suggest there, George? Yeah, so actually through our uh, service parts department, we do offer a hose guide kit. Uh, what it does is it allows you to keep those hoses out of the way, and it's, it's something that can be ordered through your dealer. Okay. Um, hydraulics on demand, we mentioned that as it tied to the TV620B. Question here as to whether it's available across the B-Series. Mm -hmm. Yes, so the great thing is it is available on all models. Uh, we've really promoted it heavily on, with the launch of our new TV620B, but it's actually available on all EH control machines and all of our EH control machines come with that display and you're able to, to adjust that uh, hydraulic flow. Another question here, um, I have some attachments that are 20 to 25 years old, but in still good working order. Can I run them on current case skid steers and CTLs? 
Yeah, I can take that one. So yes, I mean, you know, you need to go through the normal considerations, right? As you know, does your attachment coupler fit that? Um, what are the quick disconnects? You may have to change the quick disconnects so that they made up with some of the new machines. George has already alluded to that they've gone up in size over the years. Um, and you know, a couple of other considerations, just as we already talked about, if there's any specifications that are, uh, you know, that you can still remember or you can find on that attachment, it'd be important to make sure that you're not, you know, taking a, a 50 hydraulic horsepower attachment putting it on a hundred hydraulic horsepower machine you could run into some issues there um, maximum flow could be another one a lot of our our older attachments from way back when those units didn't have the amount of flow that the today's units have as well as they operated in a lower uh, main relief pressure too so those should be some considerations that should be made uh, associated to that thank you Ted and, and we've touched on this a little bit here in two different ways, but another question about, uh, and I think they're speaking specifically about OEMs, not third-party attachment manufacturers. Can I use attachments from other manufacturers on case skid steers and CTLs? Yeah, I could take this one. Yes, absolutely, you can use uh, attachments from other manufacturers. Uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, we do recommend that you do have an OEM approved attachment that you're running with the, with the machine, but we know that's not always feasible based on what your current inventory is of attachments. Also, you need to take into consideration some of the things that you know, we, we've kind of talked about already, which would be the quick disconnects themselves, as well as the uh, electrical connection. And uh, as I mentioned before, with one of the other brands, they have a seven pin connector and you may need to order an adapter to able to fit up with a 14 pin connector, which is what most of the industry has gone to. It's a universal standard nowadays. Thank you, George. And uh, with that, we have a very fitting final question here that I will, I will take myself. Gary, uh, Gary asks if the live event will be posted online for future use. And the answer to that is always 100% yes. Uh, this is posted online and emailed out to registrants after the fact uh, because, uh, again, uh, uh, having two gentlemen like George, I did it. I called you a gentleman. It <laughs> happened. Um, having two gentlemen like George and Ted take their time and, and uh, share their knowledge on, on these topics is, is uh, so important to uh, all of uh, uh, our partners and friends in the industry. And so, yes, we will gladly share that. Uh, with the folks in the industry. With that, um, I lied. I, Judson came in. I, Judson, I was just about to shut it down. <laughs> I was just about to shut it down, and you came in off the top rope with a question at the end. Uh, you touched on it earlier. What is the best way to determine flow rates for attachments? Yeah, so the best way to determine the, the flow rating for attachments, I mean, as far as if you're trying to judge its match to a machine, either the hydraulic horsepower or you could lay out just what is the maximum pressure uh, that your attachment will take, what's the maximum flow it'll take, and then you can compare those to the max outputs of, of your machine as well. I mean, that's probably the easiest way just to know very quickly if they match. Uh, and then, of course, you still have to make sure that, you know, the coupler itself fits the machine that you're going to put it on and that your quick disconnects for your hydraulic hose is also match. Right, and one more point on that. Uh, the attachment manufacturers do publish the, the range of flow that they, is the acceptable amount of flow for that attachment, so I'd also consult that as well. Thank you, gentlemen, and now for real, <laughs> we're cutting it off, we're shutting it down. But uh, take a moment here again, there's a link in the chat box right now for the next episode of Case Live. We'll be coming back to you approximately one month from now, February 23rd, to talk about undercarriage is one of uh, everyone's favorite topics. Thank you all for taking the time this morning. George, Ted, thank you guys very much and uh, we'll see you guys in the next case live.